I feel there are a couple of knitting mistakes that we rarely talk about because they have nothing to do with your knitting technique at all and still make all the difference. Hi everyone, Norman here. Today I would like to talk about 10 common knitting mistakes you might not even realize you are making. All these mistakes will have such a huge impact on the success of your finished project even though they have nothing to do with knitting a single stitch at all. In the past couple of months, I collected feedback and questions here on my YouTube channel and on my blog and sifted through well over a thousand comments and these are the 10 most frequent mistakes I noticed are at the root of the problem. So let's dive right into it and show you how to prevent them. And if you have a mistake or a knitting problem you'd like me to fix or do a video about, please comment below right now. Now, I could be telling you that a lot of knitters don't use a sharp tapestry needle to weave in their tails and then the ends come loose or how some knitters accidentally wrap the yarn for their purl stitches around the wrong way and do it clockwise instead of counterclockwise and then their stitches end up twisted or I could be talking about how a lot of beginners aren't aware that they can cast on around two needles or a needle one or two sizes bigger to get a stretchier edge. But this is not going to be this kind of video. Here are my top 10 knitting mistakes you need to avoid instead. Not locking your finished work. When I started knitting I didn't really understand why every experienced knitter talked about blocking so much. I wanted to wear my finished objects right away and not wash it and pin hundreds of pins into it much work and what for? Well, if there's one thing I regret, then certainly not learning or rather understanding why you need to block your finished projects. This is a little lace pattern before blocking and this is how it looks after blocking. I don't think I need to say more. Blocking brings your projects into shape. It will fix minor tension imbalances so your overall knitting looks much neater. Plus a lot of yarns actually contain spinning oils and a gentle wash will remove these. There is literally no disadvantage I could think of other than if you overstretch or iron your finished work or if you put it in a washing machine. And if it's a tubular project, try to cushion the edges so you don't end end up with a visible fold line or use things like sock blocking boards or a sweater blocking board. Knitting with bad lighting. This tip here might sound utterly trivial but it is not. I seriously think that the biggest mistake you can make is knitting under a bad light. The better you can see your stitches, the easier it will be to enter them precisely. And that does not only make knitting faster, it also helps you to prevent mistakes. And if there is indeed a mistake, you will be able to notice it so much faster. Plus, squinting your eyes for hours non-stop is actually not very good for them either. I almost always knit very close to a window. In fact, here behind me, that is my favorite knitting spot in my whole apartment. And whenever it's getting darker, I use one of these variable craft slides. I said it before and I'll say it again. These here were probably the best investment I ever made in knitting. 20 US dollars that saved me from so many mistakes and made knitting even with a dark fuzzy yarn a breeze. I'll add a link to the description below. Trust me, these here made all the difference for me not investing enough time to pick yarn. Picking the right yarn should be 50% of your work. Pick a bad yarn and your whole project will never get the chance to shine. And it starts with simple mistakes like picking a worsted spun 100% cheap wool yarn for socks. But it certainly doesn't end there. I know we are living in the age of indie yarn dyers and Instagram and there is a beautiful colorway hiding behind every corner. Still, you end up, then you end up with these beautiful skeins but you 
you need to Google, well, what to make with them. And make no mistake, I call myself a professional yarn hoarder first and then a YouTuber and a designer, but that's probably not the best approach. Before you pick a color, ask yourself what properties should the yarn have for the project you have in mind. Should it be soft or durable? Should it be smooth or textured? Does it have to be warm or light? Should it be machine washable? Etc. Etc. Create a little checklist, go through it and then buy yarn. Picking your speckled, hand-spun colorway for a lace shawl is probably not a good idea. Use the same yarn for a simple triangular shawl in socket stitch and it might look stellar. And if you plan to use multiple colors, check how they harmonize. And there is no need to reinvent the wheel here. These days, there are wonderful color wheel apps available to you that do the job for you. In fact, one of my last videos was all about it. I'll link it to you up in here. And here's one important tip you also need to observe. Yarn can stretch out dramatically after washing it the first time. So when you plan to knit a fitted sweater, always check how a swatch behaves when it sees water the first time. So often I see people knitting a sweater that seems to be fit perfectly on the needles and then they wash and lock it and it's two sizes too big. And then in front fanatically Google for ways to shrink it. Knitting just one more row. I'm sure you've been there before. It's 11 p.m., already dark outside. You know you should actually go to bed, but you just want to knit one more row. And once that one row is finished, well, there's room for one more, right? Gotta get to the end of that repeat after all. And this is such a bad habit for multiple reasons. First of all, the longer you knit, uh, the less concentrated you will be and this typically leads to mistakes. And then when you try to fix this mistake without a fresh mind, things often get worse. Trust me, I'm definitely not the only one who totally messed up a project beyond redemption five minutes past midnight. Instead, whenever you notice yourself thinking, just one more row, force yourself to take a break and turn that into a habit. Also, in that context, don't forget to take a break every 15 to 30 minutes. Don't slouch in that same armchair or couch for hours nonstop. Also, a good stretching or a strengthening exercise for your hands is equally as important. You might believe that you don't need it because you're young and or your hands don't hurt even if you knit for four hours straight. But you have to realize that your hands, they don't deteriorate overnight. It's a gradual thing and typically it's 10 times as easy to prevent pain than to heal it. Once you have that carpal tunnel syndrome, well, things might look quite bleak. Believing charts or patterns are the final solution. When people want to learn how to knit socks like this one, they are often pointed towards sock charts or calculators. But here's the thing, most knitting charts date back to a time where there literally was just one kind of needles and yarn available at the local yarn shop. In my youth here in Germany, that was typically Adi needles, Regia sock yarn, and everyone was of course a continental knitter. And following those sock charts produced past results. These days choices are luckily a lot more abundant. Everyone is knitting with a different yarn, different needles and a different technique and so on. So how would you expect a chart to work out when everyone is knitting with a different gauge? It just doesn't work like that. Yet so often I get questions like how many stitches do I need to cast on for a scarf, for a hat, for socks or a blanket? And the answer is always knit a swatch and try to meet the gauge of the designer or use this swatch to calculate according to the measurements. And if there is no gauge and if there are no measurements, then the cast on information is as useless as a wedding cake recipe with all the ingredients, but no indication how many ounces you need of each. So if you are new to this, go watch my tutorial on how to knit a swatch the 
right way. I'll link it to you up in here just in case. Hating to weave in ends. I can't even begin to tell you how often I read the following sentence. Yeah, I finished that sweater long ago. I only need to weave in the ends, but I hate weaving in ends. Are you one of them? In a recent poll here or in the community tab on my YouTube channel, over 20% said they hated weaving in ends. First of all, I have a full video on weaving in ends here on YouTube that will make the process so much easier as I use a sharp tapestry needle that glides through the wrong side like butter. But more to the point, you really kind of need to get your act together. Weaving in ends is part of knitting, just like doing the dishes and wringing out the garbage is part of cooking. Sure, you might not enjoy it, but that doesn't mean you can avoid it. Besides, a tapestry needle is still a needle. I mean, nobody is asking you to learn how to work with a chainsaw or fire a crossbow. It's a needle and you go through stitches. The sooner you work on that mindset, the better. A tapestry needle is one of many kinds of needles you need to have and use in your knitting arsenal. It's part of it, just like crochet hooks, double pointed knitting needles, cable needles, circular needles, single pointed needles and so on. And it's not easier, harder, well, less fun to use. It's using a needle to go through loops of yarn. So do me a favor. If you have a work in progress lying about where you only need to weave in the tails and it's been more than just a week, stop this video right now and weave in those three tails. Do it now, no excuses. The only excuse you get is if it's a big intarsia sweater with hundreds of tails, then weaving in 20 tails at a time is understandable. Using knitting patterns the wrong way. First of all, one of the worst mistakes is not keeping track of your progress. Take notes, cross out sections you already finished, put your pattern below a clear foil if you want to reuse it, build yourself a simple visor out of cardboard. So whenever you need to interrupt your knitting, you know exactly how and where to continue. And in that context, learn how to read your knitting so you can also see what you did a couple of rows below. I'll link you my full tutorial on how to read knitting up in here. Also, always make sure to read a pattern all the way to the end. Make sure that you have all the materials, test new techniques on a little swatch, and of course, make sure that you don't miss any options or alternatives. Nothing is worse than knitting a Ruckland sweater top down, only to notice down at the hem that you should have inserted those breast starts to accommodate your white bust. And of course, Always take notes of any alterations and yarn choices so you can easily replicate the results in the future in case you want to revisit the pattern or I don't know, the person you knitted those socks for like them so much they want another pair. Knitting mistake number eight, being afraid to unravel. Frogging a project can be quite liberating, especially if it was a project that has been lying around in your project bag for a year or more. You know it, I know it, you won't finish it anymore. And even if you wanted to, you probably wouldn't know how to continue anyway. Often unraveling a project feels a bit like admitting a mistake, or a lack of willpower, like it was something to be ashamed of, when the opposite is true. There is nothing wrong with changing your mind and realizing that something doesn't bring you joy anymore and getting rid of it. That's being strong, determined and really not big or a bad knitter. And this also applies to the whole knitting process. Your first sock, your first sweater, your first glove probably won't fit perfectly. Of course you can keep them, but there's nothing wrong whatsoever with reusing the yarn. Just make sure to wash it before to get rid of the print. Unraveling sections has to be seen as part of the process. Even if you plan out a pattern perfectly, things can go wrong and that is totally okay. And then you unravel it partially, use lifelines and rework this section or the whole thing until you are satisfied and it brings you joy. Just 
You know, like you reword a section of an email before sending or changing or adding ingredients or spices to a recipe you tried the first time. Embrace it and use frogging as a tool not checking your work in progress or trying it on. I already talked about taking breaks, but it's equally as important to check your work in progress frequently. Every couple of rows, you should take a minute or two and check what you have knitted. A mistake is so much easier to fix if it's only one or two rows below instead of 20. And in a similar way, do remember to try your work in progress on frequently. Put your stitches on a piece of scrap yarn if you're not working with circular needles. Compare the parts of a sweater with something you knitted before or is part of your wardrobe. You can even use pins and stitch pieces together temporarily. Never ever should you wait all the way to the end before you try something on. I've said it already a couple of times, but since this is such a frequent mistake, I'll not shy away from saying it a hundred more times. Check, measure and try your work in progress on as often as possible. Not taking care of your project and the yarn the right way. Always keep the washing instructions. In fact, if you are knitting socks, you can use the labels to store them. There's nothing worse than ruining a hand knitted garment in a washing machine. And if it's a gift, definitely pass these along. Some yarn companies even offer small little labels you can sew into the finished work with the washing instructions and I think they are also available on Etsy. Then don't ever put your hand knitted sweaters on hangers where they will stretch out. And when it comes to yarn, put it ugh, in airtight boxes. This will not only keep the moths away, this is also safe from pets, children or an unsuspecting partner. And keep these boxes out of the sun. Quite a lot of dyes will lose their vibrance when they are exposed to direct sun sunlight for a prolonged time. And the same applies to your work in progress. Invest in a good project bag. And you don't need to get a fancy leather project bag like I have here. There are cheap ones available on Amazon for as little as five US dollar. But if you let your work in progress on the couch, this is not only potentially dangerous, knitting needles can hurt a lot if you sit on them. It too will increase the chance for someone or something to mess things up for you. Anyway, this was my list of 10 knitting mistakes you need to avoid that have nothing to do with knitting itself. Please like this video if you enjoy watching, comment with your questions and your feedback. And of course, don't forget to subscribe in case you don't want to miss any new videos. Happy knitting and enjoy the rest of your day.